Am I sharing my screen? Yes, looking good. Good. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, my name is Jens Nordfeldt. And as you can see, I'm in a grocery store. Uh, at least part of the time. I, uh, I've basically spent all my working life uh, as much in stores as I have uh, as a researcher. And I am, I guess, proud to say that I, I see myself more as, a, as an innovator and, and entrepreneur, perhaps, than as, an, as a scholar. Um, I use my uh, scientific uh, toolbox more to understand what I work with uh, than the other way around. And um, to me, at least, that gives me a lot of pleasure in my job. I, I, I think um, I, I often have said that in real or in, in business, it's uh, people act too fast and without reflection. And I think at the same time in academia, things are too slow. So I, I want to be somewhere in between and I managed to find that spot. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So what I'm gonna talk about today, I, I, uh, I moved, I, I am from Sweden, as you can understand from my uh, family name and as you can hear from my accent and as you perhaps know, if you've seen me before, but I, since a couple of years, I, I live in, uh, in the UK. Uh, in a city that I didn't know existed until a couple of years ago. Uh, it's called Bath. Uh, and I, a lot of people claim that it's because it was a Roman bath uh, some 2000 years ago, but I think it's because it's raining so much. Uh, so at least to me, it's uh, very much like a bath more or less every day. I just uh, ran out because it was sun, the sun was shining when I was coming home after having left my kids this morning so I left my motorcycle outside and then I has to, had to run out because it was raining you know so you never know you never know rain one one minute and then the second minute it's, it's rain anyhow my my, my research is uh, um, it's uh, it's on grocery retailing but I try to expand uh, so I do a lot of jo jobs nowadays also with H&M uh, from time to time, I also work with IKEA and other companies. Um, and I have sort of specialized in field studies. So um, the basic way that I work is that I find something interesting in, uh, in retailing, in reality, in the stores. Um, uh, it could be a, a new technique. It's been a lot of digitalization last five years for me. Um, but it could also be a new display technique or some new phenomena like new kind of layouts, a new way of presenting items or something like that. And then we test it in the field. And if we find some significant result, uh, then we go ahead with it and run more field tests uh, and also do some laboratory studies. But I think what sort of distinguishes me from many other people uh, is that I uh, really think that the ecological validity and the field tests are uh, a very important part of, of my research. So uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today, I think some of you may, might have heard pieces of it, uh, others of you might not have heard, heard in any of it, but I'm going to pick a couple of studies that we've done on in-store technology uh, in physical stores. Um, and then I have sort of some extra slides, but I don't think we'll even get halfway through this. How many, how, do I have 30 minutes? Basically, we have, uh, yeah, 30 minutes, give and take. It's also depending on the questions or the discussion you want to have afterwards, so. Okay, but I should get going. I should stop introducing myself and get going, right? Go. Yeah, that's what you're thinking. You, you, you've been wanting to say that, but you didn't dare, right? Okay, let's see what happens if I click. Oh, uh, yeah, this, uh, this was a paper that I often use as some kind of uh, umbrella for presentations nowadays. nowadays uh, future of retailing. I think it's my most cited paper ever. Uh, it was um, an article that I wrote together with Drew Gravel and, and Rogwen a couple of years back. Uh, it was a special issue of uh, in Journal of Retailing about the future of retailing. And I think it's a poor paper. 
uh, but it's won awards and it's being cited. I don't know why. Uh, uh, oh, I thought this would, would come now. But I use it for the simple reason that I like this figure. This is uh, a figure sort of capturing the content of, of uh, that issue. And uh, I especially use uh, the two top uh, pieces of it to explain what I do. Uh, and if you look at the green uh, technology and tools to facilitate decision making, um, I think we've uh, ran at least 10 different studies in that area. Uh, I'll show you a couple of those soon. And I'll talk about a couple of uh, others that we work with. And then visual display and merchandise offer, decision, uh, offer decisions. That's that was based on a paper by Barbara Kahn, actually, when she looked at, uh, she was comparing visual merchandising online and offline, but I use it more to um, introduce a whole branch of studies that I'm running right now, which is on, um, if we think about retailing as an omni-channel, to me, that's sort of, you know, um, I. I I very much take it like that. I look at it, uh, all the channels just working together from the consumer's perspective. Um, and then, then I think that uh, the physical store perhaps should find a new role in this bouquet of different options or channels that exist. And to me at least, and the store that I have behind me, we try to experiment with uh, new layouts and we try to borrow a lot from we try to borrow inspiration from perhaps primarily Ikea and fashion stores and um, uh, yeah, well, also Whole Foods and try to sort of understand what does it do if you create a new path? What does it do to the customers and the shopping experience if you uh, create new departments? What does it do to your store if you... Um, work with more open spaces, uh, lower ta uh, more tables and shelves, uh, lower shelves. Uh, what does it do if you create hotspots like in an IKEA environment and, and move the, the shelves around a bit like in Whole Foods? And uh, like we have one project going on now in Quantum in Lerum where we uh, reshape the ends of the end caps and we, we observe shoppers how they move around and if you round off the shelves it looks as if shoppers move differently than if you have sharp edges to them so we work a lot with um, the actual physical environment and try to sort of create a more inspiring uh, environment there and uh, yeah but I tell you this now because that's too deep into the presentation so we'll never have the time to reach it so uh, I will go to, go through some of, of, of the more uh, te technological uh, or digital uh, papers instead. This um, this study, perhaps I've you've heard about it before. Uh, perhaps I've told you about it before, or perhaps you've even read it. Uh, uh, it's on the usage of smartphones in uh, grocery stores. Uh, it's uh, in Journal of Marketing, two thousand and eighteen. Uh, and um, I really like this project and it's sort of a starting point in a lot of my discussions about in-store digitalization. Um, we, we ran into this project, uh, one of the co-authors, Lauren Beitel, she had this idea, she heard about mobile blindness. I think she had somehow been involved in a car accident where texting and driving was somehow sort of an issue. and. Therefore, uh, she was interested in if this also has an effect uh, in stores. And she'd been reading in, in uh, trade journals that from the checkout line, at least, uh, sales of magazines and chewing gums and the like was really going down. So she wanted to see, okay, is this something that is a more general effect uh, in the stores? So we did a little background check. And in this case, this slide is Swedish figures. I have another one with American figures and it says the same. 97% uh, of all Swedes have a smartphone and you can see that's even an old figure. Uh, I think the US slide says 98%, but you know, it's the same. Um, 
smartphones that are picked up uh, 221 times per day, used for three hours and six, 60 minutes, we all have our uh, screen time. So we know that that's an understatement. That's an old figure. It's uh, beyond that now. Um, I heard someone say that we spend twice as much time on Facebook as we do with our kids. Um, younger age groups uh, use their mobile every other minute. Uh, I question that because my kids case, it's not the case at all, because uh, this would mean that they had to let, let their phones down every once in a while. And that sim simply doesn't happen in my kids case. They just play with it all the time. Actually, the best way to get in contact with them is to snap with them or something instead of trying to talk to them through their AirPods. Um, and actually, uh, also in the retail environment, we or in the businesses, we do a lot of things to stimulate even more uh, smartphone usage by creating apps and stuff like that. So question is, uh, is this enhancing the shopping experience in the way that we as marketeers perhaps hope it to be? Is it uh, uh, helping shoppers find good solutions, find good offers and alter alternatives and good, good prices? Uh, does it help them to remember what they are about to buy or what they should buy with shopping lists or is it mobile blindness? Um, and uh, yeah, well, I already walked you through this with uh, talking about Lauren Beitel and, and the background of the paper. And actually, um, this has been a, a major issue that the checkout line used to be uh, a big department, or not a department, but a big area. And it was counted almost like a, a single department in a lot of grocery stores because they felt that whatever they put in the checkout line this was selling good because it was so, so much of an impulse area. People stopped, people were you know, looking at the merchandise, uh, they had done all their, their musts, so they were open to suggestions for new things. But now this area has sort of died. <clears throat> so let's see what we can get. Okay, so what we did here was that we basically did a couple of studies. Uh, first, we did two different observation studies where we programmed a little app um, so we could uh, inobtrusively just observe shoppers who were standing, a uh, colleague and me were standing outside the checkout areas of these stores and just counting the number of people in line, if they were using their smartphone for listening to music or talking or, or looking at it or so, or if they weren't using a smartphone at all. And then we also uh, counted uh, if they paid any attention to the surrounding merchandise and if they purchased it anything. So that was study one. Um, and then um, I'm involved uh, in an organization that sort of, yeah, one, one of the big products is to conduct eye tracking studies in stores. So we had uh, several weeks of eye tracking data, um, some five, 600 shoppers from those quantum stores that you can see there or Quantum, Eking and Eskilstuna, uh, Maxi, Hella, Westeros and Supermarket Gryta and Westeros. So we thought, okay, let's have a look at those films and see if we can see that they that the shoppers actually use their phones. And, and then we also had the receipts and we had all the information that we needed so we could sort of build conclusions based on that. And then the results that we found that, okay, in that uh, secondary data study, we felt this is interesting, but we need to run a, a field experiment to ensure that any possible effects actually exist, not just as, uh, you know, uh, it, it couldn't be just, just correlations. We, we needed causality. So that we, we also did an experiment. And um, okay, so this is what we found uh, in the first checkout study. We observed a thousand shoppers and um, this is a grocery store. That's what it looks like. But you knew that. <clears throat> okay, so what we found was basically mobile blindness wins as a hypothesis um, because two thirds of the market disappears when people play with their phones while checking out. Uh, and this holds even if you only listen to music. So even people just listening to, you know, you can see they paid attention to something in their earphones. 
even those guys, uh, even in those cases, uh, the checkout purchases was reduced from 15% to 5% as soon as you used your phone. Okay, uh, and this was in uh, Bromma Plan, and that's uh, quite narrow and uh, sort of small store. So we thought, okay, what about if we go to a larger store where we have digital signs that we can turn on and off? Perhaps we can see if we can lure the customers from looking at their small screens to sort of opening up and taking in the environment. So therefore we moved to one of Sweden's largest grocery stores, uh, Quantum Flygfjörn Hotelje. And we talked the store manager into uh, turning on and off the digital signs uh, in the checkout line. And we had to ask him, especially, uh, especially not to involve ICA centrally in this, because then he would not be allowed to turn the screens on because it's paid for commercials. Uh, but we didn't tell him that before we sort of made sure that everything was set. So we could run the experiment uh, without the uh, knowledge of, of the ICAS media department. And we saw that, yes, we could people to pay attention to other things than their phones when we use the smart screens but or the smart uh, digital signage. But uh, we still lost half the audience uh, because then they just swapped from looking at their small screen to looking at the big screen. They still didn't buy any merchandise. So in the group uh, where we had uh, no uh, digital signage and they were not paying attention to the phones, 19% purchased something. But as soon as we had the digital screens on, only 9% of the people bought from the checkout. So obviously people think it's more interesting with digital screens than with uh, merchandise in the stores. Okay, so from there, uh, yeah, it's obvious that you have some kind of visual distraction. So from there, uh, we did this uh, analysis of the pre-existing eye tracking data. So we had, uh, I exaggerated a bit, I said 600, but that's in another study. This is only 359 shoppers. And we could see that 26% of the time they spe spent on their smartphones and 7% uh, of the time was devoted to looking at the phone. And now I have to move you a bit so I can read my figures. So I don't uh, say it wrong. 42% of the attention was used to look at products and the rest for navigating through the stores. So again, now we're not just at the checkout. Now we're at the whole, in the whole store. Uh, these are not the toe bike uh, eye tracking glasses we use anymore. I don't know why I keep this image uh, or photo. I just guess it's just to make you or to be ensured that you understand that it's an eye tracking study. Uh, so what do you think the results are now? And usually when I do this face to face, it's easy to have people raise their hands, but that's not so easy here. Uh, who of you think that people uh, buy more when they spend time on their phone while browsing or while shopping. If we can lift our hands or something like that on the digital screen. Yeah, I can see one hand, two, three. Okay, cool. And then some muted cameras. Well, okay, so who of you think that they will buy less when they uh, play with their phones while in the store? One, two. Three, four, five, okay, and then six. Okay, so obviously majority of you think that they will uh, be mobile blind. Uh, so we, we thought that too, and we were a bit surprised to find that actually uh, people spend much more time uh, or the group of people that use their phones also spent much more time in this course, in the store. So you can see it goes up from 12 to 17 minutes. That's an increase by 41%. And of course, it's time consuming to also talk. So we thought, okay, it could be sort of a natural, natural uh, explanation there. Actually, uh, people who use their smartphones also spent more money. Also there, it's an increase from uh, with 41% from 294 to 414 crowns. And um, yeah, we could see that for every second they use their smartphone, they their average spending went, went up with four crowns or 40 cents of a euro. So uh, this was, uh, 
very interesting. And we thought, okay, um, perhaps there could be uh, background factors uh, explaining this. Perhaps if you if you know that you're going for a really major trip and you have to spend a lot of time in the store, then perhaps you want to be time efficient and you make make sure that you can make some calls while you're in the store. Or perhaps you need to call and ask someone, uh, what was it that I was about to, supposed to buy? Or perhaps you have a shopping list if it's a long, major purchase. Perhaps you have a shopping list on your phone, so you, you use the phone for that reason. So we thought, okay, there can be uh, lots of confounds in this. So we need to, to run an experiment. And in this experiment, we uh, selected 120 people, asked 60, all those 120 people, we, we asked if they regularly use their smartphone also when they were shopping, and they said yes to that. So then we asked 60 of them, okay, please go ahead, use your smartphones as usual. You can text, you can call, you can browse, you can look for ingredients, you can do whatever you want. And we told 60 of them, okay, please don't use their, your smartphone during this, this shopping trip. Uh, 117 of the 120 understood the instructions. So they could be kept in, in the analysis. Three of them could not stay away from you know, playing with their phones. So obviously they had to be excluded. Uh, and what do you think about the results now? Because now it's causality. Now we've ruled out alternative explanations. Now, if you uh, spend differently when you use the phone or not, then it's causality is caused by the smartphone usage. How many of you now think that you spend more if you uh, use the phone? Oh, one, two, three, four. Okay. And how many of you think you spend less if you use the phone? Uh, well, yeah, one, okay. Well, actually we found the results to be very similar to in the first study. And uh, so shopping time increases by almost 40%. And it's not so strange. We thought, okay, we, we've been looking at these films and you know, say that you're, you're at the fruit and vegetable and you're picking some tomatoes or something, the phone rings, what do you do? You pick it up, you take a step back from the table and you start looking at the products. So we could see uh, the amount of products that you looked at was much greater. And perhaps you want to be by yourself. So you walk away to another aisle or so. And then when you hang up, you, you're, you're somewhere where you see new products. So you sort of, oh, yeah, yeah, I should have toilet tissue as well, or I should have new dishwashing detergent. So actually spending also still was around the 40% increase. So from 314 crowns to 444. And actually every time the shopper picked up the phone, the average basket size increased with seven crowns. So uh, to me, this was uh, exciting uh, because it was so contradictory. We believe we would have the opposite results. Uh, we did not see this coming. So I, I think that was sort of great. We also um, interviewed all the shoppers in this second study so we could ask them about various things such as um, how well they liked the trips uh, trip uh, trip how well they liked the store because uh, some of the retailers they were a bit worried about that perhaps shoppers if they spent more time than they assumed they would and if they felt distracted uh, perhaps they didn't enjoy the shopping environment as much, but we couldn't see any differences there, or not significant at least. But we could see that shoppers felt more distracted uh, in the case when they used the phone. So that's sort of become our explanation for it. That was a significant mediator in the model that we ran. Uh, that distraction is intermediating the smartphone usage and the other behavioral results. So. Obviously, the scarce attentive resources you have become uh, occupied by your smartphone usage, uh, usage, and then you have your autopilot is interrupted, and you sort of have to reboot the system every time you stop paying attention to, to uh, the smartphone. So this second yellow here, shop and mo shopper movement, it explains quite a lot to me, at least. Uh, it's three times as likely that you have to go back to a department that you already left 
if you use your phones as if you don't. So obviously you become sort of more of a confused shopper. You spend 40% longer time, you go back and forth more, uh, you look on different parts of the shelf that you otherwise wouldn't. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's a different thing. Um, and this is actually an example film from one of the smartphone users. And you can look, she is looking there at the fall the curve. That's where she starts. And by looking at the image right now, uh, the by far most commonly viewed object, uh, independent of age and sex, is other people's butts. So other people's butts is the perfect commercial space in a store. And now she is out here in another aisle looking at some stuff and then back. And some 40 seconds later, she is still looking at the follicle. And this is typical for what you see with the people on the smartphones. They spend a lot of time, you know, and looking at different things, but they seem almost a bit confused. Uh, actually, this is a guy who's not using his phone. And actually, the walking speed is almost twice when you don't use your phone. You speed up, uh, look for some butts, perhaps some impulse items, and then you're out of there. So it's a totally different procedure. And this is beyond conscious control, I dare say. So uh, if you think that you impulse purchase too much, leave the phone in the car. If you think that you need more inspiration, bring the phone because it forces you to sort of reboot the system and, and perhaps become a bit more uh, aware of the surroundings. So uh, what we've done with this is that we've tried to really implement this a lot. So now we're running follow-up experiments based on how to best sort of uh, enhance that um, shoppers make use of their phones while in the store. So for instance, one thing that we've uh, recommended a lot of stores to do is to take away all printed materials such as recipes and stuff, and instead have small signs with a mobile log on it. So they sort of uh, enhance the usage of, of smartphones in the stores for, for the shoppers. Um, we've also heard a lot of stores who they used to say as a store manager, they used to tell their staff not to bring their, their private phones into the store, but now they do the other way around. So they actually invite the staff to bring their smartphones into the store. And if a shopper uh, is asking for a product, uh, the instructions are to take out their phone and Google for it. Is it this one? Or if a shopper asks for a recipe, Google for it. So they teach the shoppers to use their smartphones in the store. And this might seem manipulative, but I think, you know, my take on things is that it's um, to 80% of all Swedish households, at least, it's a problem to come up with ideas for what to have for, di for dinner, especially for families with kids. And anything you can do to enhance the um, inspiration in the store or the ability for the shopper to come up with ideas. It could be simple dishes like fresh pasta, ready-made or something, but just as long as you help them to come up with ideas for what to buy for dinner, uh, then it's helping uh, and not uh, the other way around. Um, okay, and this has uh, really been uh, uh, a big thing. Um, we did a little PR activity here in the UK about this piece of research uh, half a year ago, something like that. No, a year ago, a year and a half ago. Okay, it's 19. Anyhow, um, I'm babbling. Don't, don't listen. Um, anyhow, it, it, it was amazing because I re or we, we learned that uh, this, the news about this study had reached 80 million people in the UK within 24 hours. And given that it's only 65 million living here, I think it's fantastic. So, I mean, I don't know how it happened, but it's, uh, no, so that, that was fun. And uh, then we have a follow-up study on this. And um, uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, sort of even more uh, exciting almost. Um, having 
uh, worked on that paper when we published it. Uh, Venki, uh, Venki Shankar from Texas, he, he called and said, well, couldn't we do something more? Don't you have any other cool gadgets in the stores that we can sort of experiment with? Uh, and he, uh, Venki is very good at looking at apps and, and sort of what you do with, uh, with, with your phones. So I said, well, let's try these um, terminals that uh, Ica stores have at the entrance. And at the time, not many people were aware of them, but uh, after the introduction of those uh, terminals that McDonald's have, it's become, people are, are more accustomed to it. So it's basically a huge screen, touch, or yeah, it's a touch screen. So you can go there and you can uh, print your shopping list if you have it. You can see what kind of personal discounts you have. You can check your accounts. You can look for recipes. There's a bunch of stuff you can do on these. So it's, they're intended to be some kind of, including some kind of digital universe for Ica shoppers, bank, blah, blah, blah. So, so we did a bunch of studies. I'm sorry, I, I changed format on these slides. That's why it looks a bit funny here, but we did a bunch of studies on this. Uh, this is uh, third round JM now. Uh, and, uh, yeah, again, primarily field experiments because we feel that we need to have the ecological validity with it. So in this first one, we uh, simply asked people uh, to either use the kiosk or not. And then we measured uh, how much they were buying and we could see a lift in sales for 20% in the group that used the kiosk. Uh, okay, so then we were interested in, uh, is this independent of what you show on the kiosk? And we could see that uh, that was not the case. So the lift uh, only came when they were looking for recipes. As soon as some kind of uh, deals condition applied, as soon as they were looking for discounts, their economic side took over and all the inspiration just flew out the door. So uh, deals condition or inspiration and deals condition are on equal levels as the control. So this was only when we were able to make them use the recipe condition. And after this, Ica changed the front of the screens from uh, having just text saying, here you can find your discounts to showing images of uh, dishes. And then we did an MTurk study. So this is what, you, what it looked like if you were part of the panel. You're entering a store, you're swiping your card, and then you enter into, onto a page. And here we had two different scenarios. Either it's this weekly flyer that you see, so you see the discounts, or you see the same products, but instead included in the recipe. So it's the same promotions that you see, but the the... Uh, the context for them are different. And then you enter into a store and there you make purchases. After you're done with this, um, we also asked some questions about how the shopping uh, had gone about and so on. Let's see if I can quit that, yeah. Okay. That's just the conditions. And then we see again here that uh, it's in the inspirational condition that we get the lift that we want. And uh, we see that um, in both cases, the dis discounted items get similar lifts, but in the inspirational condition, uh, you also trade the brand on promotion to other brands in the same category. So say that it's a Pepsi Coca, uh, Pepsi Cola uh, on promotion, but you like Coca Cola, then you buy your favorite. So it enhances the category and not just the promoted brand if it's in the inspirational condition. And we can also see that it enhances the sales of related items. 95% of everything you buy is bought to be consumed together with something else. You don't buy a battery to have the battery, you buy to put it in something and you don't buy pasta to eat it by itself. You have some pasta sauce with it. So uh, what we saw here is that uh, in the inspiration, in the recipe condition, people 
really opened up and started to understand what they should use the products together with. So they didn't see the product, they saw the solution to a greater extent. And also, um, when we uh, asked, when we asked how did, or please explain the thought process behind your decisions, then we could see that in the inspirational condition, they'd been thinking about using the product. So, well, I'm gonna bake this cake because it's my kid's birthday and she's gonna have eight friends over and they need drinks and they need uh, balloons and they need, so they were, you know, expanding their horizons and their thinking to a much more higher level than just staying on the cupboard. What do I have? What, what do I miss at home kind of level? So it was a totally different kind of thinking process behind uh, when you had the, the inspirational condition. And then in the uh, fourth or fifth or so study, uh, we created an app. So we would see if we could get the same on any kind of interactive screen. And we found the same effects here. So also when you instead had this on a, on a smartphone, instead of on, on the kiosk, you have the same uh, effect. And eventually we did this test where people were either browsing through a gardening uh, magazine or a cooking magazine prior to the test. And then we see that the effect is gone if you have browsed through the cooking uh, magazine. So obviously this effect is more or less the same as if you browse a cooking magazine. And I think that any retailer would really love to have the customers walking around in the store browsing a cooking magazine because that really opens up to all the inspiration that they need. And uh, when, when I try to sort of uh, explain this effect, I like to, to use this metaphor. I have uh, um, my wife's brother's girlfriend. I don't know what you call that relationship, but you understand it's, a, she's close, but not, she's, yeah, well, now she has a sister and uh, her sister is perfor perfect for my wife's brother's sister or uh, girlfriend, because uh, she says that this sister of hers is the perfect personal shopper. Uh, when my wife's brother's girlfriend goes to a fashion store to look for new outfits, she can go there and she can look at all the, all the garments, but she doesn't find anything. She doesn't come to any conclusions. But when her sister is with her, in five minutes or so, she has, you know, collected like three outfits that fits well on her, fits well with her style and that go well together. So she's really like uh, perfect in that sense. Sorry, my phone is ringing. I'm just gonna turn it off. Um, and here, I think that the smartphone in the grocery store can be that personal shopper. It can be that shopping assistant helping you to create the inspiration. So you, if you start Googling for recipes in the store, you really have that sister with you or that personal shopper with you. So taken together, the mobile effect of the 40% increase because you break up the habits, you break up the autopilot, and then combined with this uh, inspirational use that you can get from Googling for recipes, I think this is dynamite. Uh, I mean, I've been working enough in, in grocery stores to know that if you find something that manages to lift the sales with a couple of percent, you're happy. But in this case, 40% and it's, you know, repeated. We've done that study uh, on mobile phones. We've done it a couple of times since. Um, and it's last, the effect is as strong uh, three years after we did the initial tests is still as strong. It's 40% or more still. And it holds for basically everybody in basically all types of gross, kinds of grocery stores. And combine that with this recipe inspiration kind of thing. I think it's fantastic. So um, we're basically doing a bunch of research on in this area now. Uh, we're trying with H&M, the H&M in-store app. Uh, we just published a paper on, um, on self-scanning. 
Um, and self scanning is interesting in the sense that it makes people more, uh, they buy healthier items, they read more on the, on the labels, they increase their, their uh, spending because they think it's more fun to shop. And they don't only shop from displays, but they go closer to the products and they shop more from the shelves. So with all those digital tools, you can really um, extend the way that humans interact with the products. Uh, one project that's, uh, we, we're about to submit it, uh, so it's a bit earlier, but there we work with augmented reality and um, we project uh, scenarios on the floors of, of uh, the retail stores uh, and get similar effects. In all these cases, a common, uh, common denominator is that people um, explain that they see the use, uh, they, it's easier for them to understand the usage of the products. So they, uh, it's not just a forest of, or a jungle of products on the shelves the products that we somehow promote stand out a bit and they can see that it's not the drill, it's a hole. They can see it's not the package of pasta, it's a dish. So I think uh, in that sense, it, it's really a win-win. It doesn't just help the retailer and uh, the store to sell more. It actually helps the shopper quite a lot as well. So amazing, Jens. Amazing. Uh, sorry for interrupting you. Uh, I understand why you're interrupting me. So I can just jump uh, 40 slides down or something and show you that because that's sort of a, a little summation of things. And we can, I can have that in the background while I answer yeah. questions. It is, uh, I open up for uh, questions. I have anyone want to begin here for Jens? Uh, just raise your hands if you have uh, any questions. Carries? Yeah, thanks. Thank you, uh, Daniel. Thanks so much, Jens, for a really interesting presentation. Um, a lot of really exciting sounding projects there. Um, something that just struck me um, towards the end here is that you talked about um, that this is a win for the store and a, potentially a win for the customers as well who are getting more inspiration about what they um, uh, can cook and what they can eat. Um, with my sustainability hat on, I was wondering if uh, you have any information from any of these studies about whether this is also any kind of win um, for the environment, because obviously overconsumption is a, a big problem today. Uh, about 50% of the food that we waste is wasted by households. Um, and I'm wondering whether um, with any of these projects, with any of these uh, uses of technology, are consumers only buying more or are they sometimes buying better, such as more organic or more seasonal or more uh, perhaps uh, food that's with lower carbon emissions or are, do you have any information or, or any ideas on how you might get information potentially on whether they're buying better, whether that food is actually being used in a good way uh, as well as just bought? Um, when it comes to that, I think um, what you have here, uh, at least in the two projects that I went into more detail on, uh, the mobile and the kiosk, uh, they are vehicles uh, and they could be used to uh, elevate sales of more sustainable products. Uh, but there is really up to the retailer. I mean, it's like an, an end cap display. Depend if you show that it's very effective or efficient, then it's up to the retailer uh, what to, to put there. If it's a, uh, you know. Um, something that's just going to be uh, like a, a big pack or something where you know that 50% or 30% of it will be thrown away. So it's, I, I think when it comes to that, uh, it should be in dialogue, I guess, with the shoppers or, or with uh, themselves. Um, so these are more vehicles than uh, that they focus on uh, something that is sustainable or not sustainable for that matter. But when it comes to the, the self-scanning paper, 
uh, I thought uh, it's interesting. We always work in quite large teams, and the, the bits that I find interesting are always the bits that uh, the others find, you know, totally nonsense. But uh, what I really found was interesting there was that consumers really uh, paid attention to the content in ways that I've never seen before. And we saw that in that case, people with cell scanning uh, devices, they bought more healthy items and in also more uh, ecological items because it often goes hand in hand. So uh, if you want, I think they became more conscious of what they were doing because they, it wasn't as much of a robotized, you know, and just walking around, putting things in the basket. It was more of a, since you had to sort of look for the label, you had to interact with the package, you became more aware of what you were doing. And this spilled over to becoming, or leading to that people actually bought more, more uh, uh, healthy items. So I expect that might be also the case. We have two projects now where we work with various kinds of codes. So you use your camera on the phone to collect information about the product. And especially in the H&M case, uh, this is used to look at the production of the product and the environmental footprint of, of the whole thing. Um, we haven't even gotten any results from that yet, but I expect it to be, I mean, it, it's, uh, it would surprise me if we did not get results pointing in the direction that people get more of that kind of information about the environmental footprint and therefore also act on it. So I, I, I see lots of options and especially with those items or gadgets where you have to, uh, or where you're uh, helped to interact more with the packages, then you, you use the information in better ways, I think. Great, thank you. That's really good That's to hear, helpful. actually. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Arno, please. Uh, I have mm -hmm. I have one question, Cecilia. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jens. Should, uh, oh, yeah. uh, oh, no, please, uh, you first, and then Cecilia will have the word after you. Yeah, okay, I will try to make it short. So thank you very much for the interesting presentation. I really liked it a lot. Um, I was wondering about uh, yeah, the causal relationship that you claim between the smartphone use and uh, in-store sales. Um, so first, I think it's yeah, really interesting to see this relationship because as you mentioned, it's not what I would have expected. Uh, so I think you explained it really nicely. And I think uh, understanding the underlying mechanisms uh, could be interesting as well. Uh, because, for example, I use my uh, smartphone to actually improve my functional shopping. Uh, so uh, I have uh, my smartphone and I can uh, sort my uh, items that I want to shop uh, based on the, the store, like how it's uh, uh, in the store, how I find them in the store. So it actually helps me to uh, yeah, improve my functional shopping. So I think um, to the points that you raised there is that indeed, if you use your smartphone and you're still looking for some products, then indeed uh, you can expect this, uh, this improvement of uh, the in-store sales. Um, I was actually wondering about how you tested the relationship. Um, so it's not really uh, a big issue, I think, but uh, just a question that raised me was whether the users that, um, that you considered as um, non-smartphone users that you did not allow to use their smartphone, were they usually using their smartphone to do shopping, yes or no? And would this impact how they actually are doing uh, their shopping? So if they were used to using the shopping in a store and you uh, take this element out of their habit, uh, maybe it's, uh, it explains why they um, yeah, go faster through this, uh, the store because they... Uh, they ran uh, out to be able to use their phone again. Yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, if, if they are really using to, uh, uh, used to using their, their, their phone in the store, um, so this was maybe uh, one element that uh, yeah, might need some clarification. Mm -hmm. uh, well, first, um, yeah, we were really careful about uh, 
that the groups were identical in all means. Uh, so they, uh, they all had smartphones. They all uh, typically, you know, use their smartphones like people do. And as I showed you in the first study, approximately 7% of the time is used for, you know, checking the phone while in the store. So uh, all that was controlled for. And when it comes to, so it was a between samples uh, measure. We used um, process um, model four. So sort of the regular statistical procedure for testing it. Uh, but when it comes to the issue that you raise about that, um, uh, perhaps if you take the phone away from them, they will somehow behave differently. We didn't control for that. But we did another test uh, that perhaps raises the um, uh, reliability or validity or, or the trustworthiness of, of the, the or robustness of the testing. And that was uh, in the eye tracking films, we did a similar thing uh, as we did with in the first uh, eye tracking study where we just correlationally looked at people who use their phone and those who don't. Uh, and the, the second test we did was that we looked at people who shop with others and compared it to shop people who, who, who don't. And uh, truth is that people who shop with others, uh, not a uh, parent with their kids, because that's terrible, but uh, two grown-ups shopping together or two equally aged shopping together, they, their, their shopping pattern resembles someone shopping with a smartphone a lot. Mm -hmm. So um, again, the uh, metaphor of the phone as a shopping assistant, uh, it's almost like, you know, uh, there's almost as if you have someone there and they help you to think uh, or to take a break when you otherwise just would rush through. So um, actually, I don't think any of the reviewers or anyone ever raised that question that you, that you raised. And it's a good question. But no, I, I don't have any, have any good defense against it. But I, I, I still believe in the effect because I've seen it so many times. And uh, as I said, I also think it, it resembles like when you shop with someone and so on. Yeah, I also trust your work. So I really liked the presentation, really interesting work. So uh, thank you for presenting. It was oh, nice. Thank you. thank you. Okay, Cecilia, I think you, ha you have the last question. Okay, thanks. <laughs> thank you for the presentation. Uh, I think it's very interesting. And for me, it's very stri striking that can um, improve the value of the shopping basket in general with these methods. And I, I know you work together with a lot of grocery retailers. Have you seen any initiative from them how to use this kind of material to improve the uses of uh, mobile phones in their stores? Is there any? Yeah, yeah we, we, um, we've had quite a lot of workshops actually together with several retailers and uh, like I said, uh, to take down or take out print material and start to put up instead use uh, put up uh, screens to take photos of, and uh, like I also said, it was uh, a guy, a retailer, a store owner in in Norrviken, Magnus Vasian, who told me that he uh, had stopped. He, he he had gone from stopping his his staff to bring their smartphones to actually encourage them to bring their phones instead. And that's something that's been spread, at least in the ECA world, that it's good to use your phone to, when a customer is asking about a specific kind of mustard, you bring up your phone and look at it. No, we don't have that. Or yes, we have that. And it's over here. Or if they ask, can I use basil in this recipe instead of something else? You Google for the recipe. So you sort of teach the, the customer. Uh, Maxi stores have started to have holders for their smartphones on the shopping carts. So it used to be that you had a holder for, for the cell scanning device, but no, also Max, at least in the East uh, region around Stockholm, they have holders for the smartphones on the shopping, on the, on the trolleys. Um, and we're, we're testing, we're making tests also with uh, QR codes. Um, 
to uh, and actually that, that's related to the first question because uh, uh, the QR codes that we the pages that we have linked via the QR codes are instead of putting up too much information about uh, uh, local production, we put up just an image of the farmer or so, and then a QR code for the shopper to use their phone instead. And we see that uh, shoppers, you know, in general, they find it very, they like their phones. They want to be able to do things with their phones. The only downside is that they, uh, some shoppers complain that they have to use their phones so much in the stores now that they, they need to recharge. So we had a little project going also at Ica about having um, a charger in the handle of the trolleys, but uh, uh, that was too problematic, you know, because they were not charged, the trolleys were not charged themselves. So people, they, they uh, used the trolleys, filled them with frozen and stuff like that, and then realized that the phone wasn't charging. So they just put pulled the cart away and, and went for another cart. So that was not working very well. But um, yeah, th there's been a lot of uh, effort. But I still think um, both these studies together, um, they deserve even more attention. So actually, right after this meeting, we're actually in three minutes, I'm going to jump into a meeting with uh, some Ica Quantum retailers on the West Coast and talk about this. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and uh, from all of us, Jens, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we, uh, your research is amazing. Um, we could uh, talk about this for uh, the rest of the afternoon, but we have uh, other uh, amazing research uh, to be present. So you, you will mi be missing out here, both uh, Eleonora's and Arno's research. Yeah, uh, I think I have, have half an hour with the quantum retailer. So as soon as that's done, I, I might be popping by again. You're welcome. Uh, but once again, thank you a lot. Thank you. So, um, uh, hopefully we'll continue the discussion about retail research later on uh, yes. when you're uh, when you're on site in Lund or something like that yes uh, but okay I uh, so now it's time for um, Eleonora can you are you able Back to share the screen see you tomorrow Ciao. Bye. bye bye okay so I can share my screen. Okay. Do you see my slides properly? Yeah, we have it. Excellent, Perfect. excellent. So um, let, let's start, let's go. We are hungry, we want to learn more. Thank you, thank you very much. I hope to satisfy these uh, expectations. So similarly uh, to Jens, I work on uh, innovation and technology management for retailing. So I work on uh, consumers usage of new technologies and uh, on uh, managers uh, in usage of uh, new technologies, but also I work with uh, uh, service providers and uh, technologist on uh, how to develop new effective uh, technologies. So in this presentation, I uh, described the results of a, a recent published study on a specific uh, technology, which is related to artificial intelligence. And in, in this case, it works on uh, online scenario, even if I usually prefer the offline uh, uh, retailing. So this is just a quick introduction on myself. Uh, as I told you, I work at Bristol University, the School of Management, and uh, uh, my background comes from uh, psychology, uh, social science, uh, and engineering. So I try to synthesize this uh, uh, multidisciplinary interest in my research. So I tend to use, to combine different perspectives to uh, investigate 
innovation and new technologies for retailing. Uh, so this is a, an overview of my presentation. So as I mentioned to you, it comes from a paper recently published on the Journal of Retailing and Consumer Services, and it is uh, uh, related on the um, introduction and diffusion of uh, artificial intelligence uh, related system as a form of uh, new uh, customer assistance. So I will describe briefly uh, why this research, uh, some theoretical background, the methodology. Uh, in this research, we used a new method of research because we based the uh, data collection and analysis on uh, uh, patented innovation. And then uh, some concluding remarks um, coming from this research and uh, uh, suggestions for future studies. So um, artificial intelligence is not a new concept because uh, uh, we started talking uh, a long time ago about this, but recently it gained attention also in uh, marketing discipline and uh, um, in retailing. Since uh, uh, the actual artificial intelligence systems allow the development of new and more efficient uh, uh, virtual assistants. On the right hand side of uh, the slide, you can see some uh, example of uh, um, these uh, customer assistants are put in place. So this is, these systems are actually able to mimic uh, human language conversation and uh, uh, provide some uh, realistic experiences. The level of realism is based on the quality of the uh, specific artificial intelligence technologies. Here we have two examples. Uh, one is uh, for uh, the um, Tommy, Alf Tommy Alfiger brand, and the other one is uh, for uh, uh, service, uh, um, an uh, energy service provider in UK. Uh, the Tommy Elfiger one is available on uh, Facebook as a chat available for all customers, while the uh, Sparks Energy one is available only on their website. But we saw that many brands are actually introducing in their Facebook pages or in their website the possibility to interact with a sales assistant uh, who, the, uh, who provide 24-7 um, uh, assistance if compared with the traditional uh, human employees. And this is one of the reasons why this uh, new form of assistance is becoming so popular. So the aim of this specific research is to provide a comprehensive understanding of the actual progresses in the technology in this specific field. Uh, so we focused on a chatbot as an example of artificial intelligence systems. So chatbot is actually uh, that kind of system uh, based on artificial intelligence that uh, provide automatically uh, customer assistance online. So uh, from uh, past studies, uh, we know that the benefits of interacting with a digital assistant are uh, uh, functional because they allow people to save time and to support uh, some purchase decision, but also uh, social because there is a sort of pleasure deriving, deriving from the interaction with the, uh, with the firm. However, there are still some issues based on the quality of the interaction. So how much this interaction really mimic the, real, the interaction with a real um, assistant. Since the quality of the interaction is the fundamental element providing uh, value for a customer. Uh, assuming that uh, this uh, virtual assistant is based to, uh, is able to fulfill uh, any um, 
request of a, a customer. And uh, thanks to the uh, continuous advancement in computer science, this uh, sort of interface between a co consumer and company is uh, uh, improving, improving uh, uh, quite constantly. Uh, so we will see that there are different uh, uh, 3D graphics used to make the experience more realistic and try to reply to this uh, um, issue based on the quality of interaction. So these, uh, um, these are examples of actual uh, um, chatbot used. I call them chatbot even in some case they uh, look like uh, a human as on the right hand side. So um, these are uh, autonomous agents that uh, mimic uh, human uh, cognitive uh, processes to reply to customer uh, request. They can be avatars or animated pictures or agents that want or just chat, as we saw in the case of a Facebook experience, that mimic the uh, real sales person. Uh, the, fe the features characterizing these uh, uh, chatbots um, are based on the gender. We can uh, even have gender neutral or male, female. But we, also, we can also have some non-verbal behaviors uh, for the most advanced ones, like eye gaze and gesture and movement and body language. Uh, if we can see on the left hand side, this is a basic example of uh, um, a picture that just uh, type the responses, while on the uh, right hand side, we see a more complex and more realistic salesperson uh, that can also move uh, around to uh, improve the, real, the realism of the experience. Uh, also, past, past studies demonstrated that uh, uh, the more agents display human-like characteristics and behavior, as a gesture, body language, etc., the more customers will be willing to relate with the digital assistant. So if it is just a chat, consumers are still reluctant to talk with the um, virtual agent. But if it looks like a real uh, sales assistant, they are more willing to interact with them and access the service. Um, now, uh, these uh, virtual uh, um, assistants, these uh, chatbots, are becoming uh, quite popular, but uh, the first example of these is, uh, and I usually like uh, providing these examples also to my students, it uh, is already available in the uh, 2001 uh, uh, movie, Minority Report. I don't know if you have ever watched it. And in that movie, Spielberg with uh, MIT uh, hypothesized how the, um, uh, how the uh, virtual salesperson may look like based on artificial intelligence. And this is uh, just a screenshot from uh, the movie. If you want, there is uh, uh, the link to access uh, for, uh, to the uh, full piece of the movie uh, reporting this uh, interaction. So this uh, uh, virtual uh, uh, agent are based on uh, some uh, algorithm like uh, machine learning and uh, natural language processing and rule-based expert system, neural networks, deep learning, uh, phys even physical robots. If you ever interacted with uh, uh, Pepper, it is one of the most famous example of uh, a robot uh, um, assistant uh, in store. And the with the aim to help consumers uh, simplifying the information provided on the web pages or 
in the physical store when they are uh, present. And now they are not very popular, ex uh, apart from the example of uh, uh, pepper, there are no other examples of this kind of uh, um, artificial intelligence system uh, placed in the real store, but as I anticipated to you, they are uh, quite uh, uh, popular on the web pages and uh, Facebook. Uh, in this research, we used uh, patent analysis since uh, uh, patents reflect the innovation and synthesize the evolution of technology in a certain area or of interest which means that they are able to synthesize these uh, in a, a sector or specific industry or at a country level. The patent is a, a set of documents that describe the technical feature of a certain invention, the criteria for claiming the originality, the market attributes, information about uh, inventor, uh, commercial value, uh, feasi feasibilities, and so on. And they are characterized by bio biographic data, like the name of uh, uh, applicants, inventors, uh, uh, classification, and uh, uh, description, including uh, an abstract and the full description of uh, this invention. So when we um, analyze uh, patents, we are talking about innovations that are not yet uh, in the source or uh, uh, not applied. Usually, since an innovation is patented, it may take up to five years to see um, adopted uh, by retailers. However, there are some uh, inventions that uh, never have never been uh, adopted. However, it anticipates the trends and uh, uh, describe uh, the area of uh, um, development uh, in this moment. This is why we use uh, the, the patents. So we collected uh, the patents from the European uh, patent, uh, from uh, um, a worldwide database, and I will uh, uh, mention to you shortly. Then uh, we uh, collected uh, the patents put in uh, um, document corpus that we analyzed through uh, textual analysis. And uh, to this end, we used uh, uh, WordStat uh, software and uh, text mining uh, techniques already available in the software uh, such as the thematic patterns within each uh, uh, document. So we uh, accessed the Orbit platform. This is a worldwide comprehensive database of all granted patents. So all these inventions are protected by the patent. And we uh, have no information about the invention submitted, but not patented. To select uh, the relevant uh, patents, we uh, specify the words chatbot in the title, and we started uh, since 1998, which represents the first date of publication of a patent related to chatbot, and we uh, completed in uh, 2018, in May. Through this uh, technique, we accepted close to uh, 700 patents, distributed across the international classification uh, categories. So here you see that uh, um, all the uh, classification categories uh, from the uh, international patent offices. And uh, we, uh, when uh, we uh, set a chatbot, it, uh, each patent is associated with a classification and we see that uh, they are almost distributed in different categories, even if, as expected, the main represented category is computer technology. So uh, we used the software WordStat to make to understand the most frequent words, 
most uh, frequent topics and uh, um, sorry the uh, tables is uh, covering the the words but is uh, the most frequent uh, um, phrases this uh, frequency analysis is based on uh, um, machine learning uh, algorithms already available in WordStat. And based on these uh, algorithms, we, we identified that the most represented, the most recurrent um, factor in all uh, the patterns is a conversational agent, followed by natural language, dialogue system, agent service, conversational agent service, computing device, etc. So it gives us an idea on uh, uh, which area are the most uh, developed at the moment. So the first uh, uh, result is uh, that based on these, uh, we see an emphasis on the conversation. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, came from uh, the topic analysis and the conversational agent and natural language from the phrases analysis. I didn't report for time constraints all the tables with uh, these results, but in case I can uh, uh, make them available for you and they are included uh, uh, in the paper I'm uh, referring to. So it means that the research now is strongly focused on finding a, a better system to simulate a real conversation so that consumers have the feeling to talk with a real person, even if it is a, a, um, a machine. If you have ever uh, um, tried to talk with a, a virtual uh, sale assistant based on this, you can uh, see that uh, the quality of interaction is uh, still poor since they are not uh, able to recognize uh, all the uh, phrases that you can uh, uh, type. For instance, some system even ask you to keep the sentences shorter. This is the case of uh, UPS. If you ever tried to access, uh, uh, to interact with someone, especially during the COVID, is actually a nightmare, you can rely on the chatbot offered by UPS, but this system can only answer to very basic, basic questions with a short sentence. And they usually recognize the request based on a couple of words included in the sentence. So it means that these words are uh, not present in your uh, uh, request. The system is not able to help you. Um, secondly, the patents on chatbot are mainly related to new system methods and devices for conversational agent to simulate the natural language. And uh, ultimately, uh, ultimately improve the interactions between a cost, consumers and retailer. In this case, represented by the digital assistant. This is, uh, um, this comes from the latest analysis that we did. This is a dendrogram. It, uh, uh, it is actually the results of a cluster analysis. Uh, and it reinforces uh, the previous uh, uh, results uh, about uh, what are these uh, um, uh, new technologies related to chatbot about. So you see uh, that there are some clusters stronger than others. That means that the words come together more often. And uh, uh, here there is a, a summary of... Uh, uh, the cluster, which are represented also with different colors. And uh, we see, for instance, uh, uh, we see from cluster one, uh, OK, um, the image is in a high resolution, but I had to uh, cut a little bit uh, to put in the slides. But in cluster one, there is the word automatically 
linked with uh, uh, real time and uh, access and location. And uh, these associations uh, suggest that there is a potential avenue for, res for uh, uh, technology based on the ability of chatbot to detect uh, in real time the location of the user and adapt the content uh, uh, of information accordingly. Uh, so far, what is uh, actually adopted in the real life is that you can uh, access this uh, agent only in the online context, but you can see from the patents that there is a research of new agents that can be uh, placed in the real uh, uh, stores. And uh, uh, there is uh, a research also to make these uh, um, agent able to start the conversation with uh, consumers and to help them in the stores, even if consumers don't actually approach them or to simplify the interaction if, if the uh, sales assist, the virtual uh, agent automatically detect uh, the position in order, for instance, uh, to provide indication on uh, uh, product location in the store. Or uh, um, similarly, on a, uh, another cluster, uh, like cluster 10 emphasizes the relationship between uh, um, uh, determining, generating, receiving, transmitting, identifying, and computing, which means that this system um, based on, uh, on uh, uh, new developments on uh, uh, sensors and uh, microchips are able not only to fast recognize, uh, recognize particular uh, states of consumers, but also to reply immediately. Because another issue is related about the time to provide a reply to customer. Uh, with uh, the uh, real employees, uh, this uh, uh, reply is quite immediate, but with the system, there is a still work to make this fast as in, in the real life. Um, if you just scroll down, for instance, uh, uh, cluster 16 is uh, on the link between a customer interaction, detecting and identify, which means that uh, the, uh, the interaction is uh, strongly based on the ability of the system to detect and identify consumer state or consumer request from the presence of uh, particular words. If the vocabulary of the system is, is uh, uh, limited, as it happens uh, now with uh, many um, virtual agents, the system is not able to satisfy uh, many consumers' requests and to satisfy many uh, consumers. So it means that consumers cannot uh, uh, access a satisfying uh, support and uh, it, gen it may result in a, a negative feeling, ne negative feedback for consumers, uh, damaging brand uh, reputation and so on, based on requests that the uh, system had to satisfy for consumers. Uh, in the case of uh, UPS, for instance, uh, if uh, you cannot uh, uh, track properly a package and you ask the system to understand exactly where the package is or why the package has been delayed of one business day, the system is not actually to provide this information. But if you, can, uh, you are lucky enough to access uh, a real uh, employee, he can track for you and can give you some uh, reasonable explanation. Maybe not 100% uh, uh, satisfactory, but uh, at least some explanation. And they can even uh, collect some complaints, claim, and so on, that uh, actually the real, uh, the virtual uh, um, sales person is not able to take. 
um, so concluding, we see that uh, um, there are some uh, major areas of development which may result into uh, better and new chatbots for retailers to be introduced. So there is a, a huge research from a, a technology and a computer sciences side on uh, providing better, more efficient, more realistic uh, chatbot or virtual sales agent that retailers should take into consideration. Uh, this research also provides an understanding of the actual progresses in chatbot since it um, encompasses all the patented uh, uh, innovations in this uh, sense. And uh, specifically, the areas for innovating are on the instant messaging, audio recognition, because so far, uh, the chatbot that you see in place online, they only type uh, replies and they only collect consumers' requests from written text. However, the research is quite uh, uh, forward since it is already providing such systems able to uh, identify the request from the voice, so audio uh, recognition. Then uh, social media, uh, which is related to the integration of this new system into actual social media. There are some uh, chatbots available for Facebook, but not yet in place for uh, um, Instagram or uh, Twitter. Uh, and uh, um, of course, it uh, uh, anticipate and predict uh, uh, the massive increase usage of uh, um, chatbot on uh, uh, Facebook Messenger and uh, Twitter bots, even if it is uh, still uh, scarcely used if compared with uh, uh, Facebook. And uh, audio recognition, if you think about uh, Alexa and Siri, it is uh, available for Hino in-home usage, but not integrated yet in uh, uh, retailers and uh, brands uh, pages uh, and uh, not at all in the physical store. And uh, uh, especially auto audio recognition uh, is uh, interesting since it synthesizes the possibility to automatically draw inferences on users starting from multiple data sources and to use this information to provide uh, users with more uh, customized, custom, customized solutions. Of course, there are some, uh, um, uh, there is a, a still a limited theoretical advancement concerning the topics of conversational agents, dialogue systems and consumer digital interfaces from a marketing and especially retail uh, perspective. So uh, there is a need on new research uh, in marketing and retailing in this uh, sense, because so far the theoretical uh, advancement are, only, are mainly related to computer science and uh, uh, there is a still a scarce evidence in marketing and retailing. Um, more research is needed to understand whether and to what extent these uh, uh, innovative features of this uh, particular agent are uh, uh, going to significantly affect customer interaction and uh, usage. For instance, uh, how the customer would approach this agent and conduct the conversation and how these agents would be integrated in the web page and in the physical store and would start uh, the conversation to keep consumers engaged. Uh, finally, future study can also uh, focus on how this feature can be uh, profitably 
incorporated in retail settings, embracing uh, uh, not only the online perspective the online scenario, but uh, um, an omni-channel pers perspective. So uh, how this uh, uh, virtual agent can be, used, can be used to provide a better customer experience in an omni-channel perspective. So uh, merging and combining more efficiently the offline, online, mobile, and uh, social media uh, scenario. Have you any question? I didn't access the chat since I was uh, sharing my screen, so I don't know if you taped uh, something so far. Thank you a lot, Eleonora. Uh, let's go for questions. I don't see any questions at the chat. Let's let's do the, go for the questions now. Who's uh, who's the number one? Go for questions. then uh, I will start them. Um, so uh, uh, I enjoyed your study, Eleonora. I like your presentation. The, the, uh, as we all know, digital uh, technology advances and it's uh, exponentially growing. And uh, bots is an interesting uh, area to study. Um, uh, and of course, we're all aware of uh, Siri, Alexi, and how, how that will influence not only on our data lives, but also uh, uh, in our shopping, in our consumption, and also how it uh, will influence retail. So um, uh, uh, I have a little sp specific interest in uh, potential bots that helps the consumer, for example, um, if you're shopping for clothes, you're uh, maybe you put in your uh, shopping baskets. Let's say you have a, a pair of jeans, you put in uh, maybe uh, different sizes and things like this, uh, different colors, different models, just to make sure that it's, uh, uh, I, um, uh, I get the size that I want, the model that I get, the right fit and things like this. This type of shopping behavior will lead to a lot of uh, returns, for example. So they could, uh, is, did you see anything in the patents that was uh, about bots that uh, helps to advise the, um, the consumer in its uh, purchasing behavior? It could be, could also be like, uh, you could uh, shop more um, environmentally sustainable by, uh, by uh, instead of ordering many small orders, putting one order every day, you could make a one big um, shopping occasions, it, something like this, nudging consumers, how to be more environmental friendly or something like that. Uh, and remember, we don't have this today in, in uh, but could you see anything like this in the patent? What I have seen is uh, uh, the interest uh, to propose to provide the new shop, virtual shopping assistant to reduce uh, the uh, return, which is uh, a, a huge issue, especially now that uh, due, to, due to COVID, uh, we largely moved to uh, online shopping. However, the online shopping also resulted in, a, uh, in more uh, uh, return behavior. What I've seen so far is uh, for, um, especially fashion uh, retailers, that uh, artificial intelligence systems are able somehow to suggest you the best size of brands that you already know or uh, uh, of uh, new brands. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, you explore an um, e-commerce platform, you need to buy a new pair of jeans, you don't know exactly this brand, you are unsure with the size. So the chatbot can, uh, would ask you uh, if you have already bought something in the same, uh, of the same brand, so in which size you have bought, and uh, if you have bought a, a jeans of a, uh, another brand and uh, ask you to list, uh, to mention uh, the other brands. And uh, also if you can rec 
if uh, uh, you see your body shape uh, among the possible uh, figures that uh, uh, the chatbot provides to you. And based on this, the chatbot will suggest you for this brand, this uh, uh, good by this size. So it helps you to find a to, uh, to uh, fix somehow the issue related to the uh, wrong size. However, uh, until uh, uh, May 2018, there were not, uh, there was not a, a strong research on uh, sub supporting uh, the sustainability. So especially in uh, grocery uh, stores, so uh, for instance, uh, suggesting a specific kind of uh, food with a specific expiring date uh, or uh, uh, so on. So this is uh, uh, still a new area uh, of research. Okay, thank you. Keris, go on for questions, yes. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Eleonora. This is a really, really interesting subject, I think. Um, uh, yeah, and a very interesting presentation. Um, I had a question uh, referring to um, value, and I think you talked about quite uh, that quite near the beginning of the presentation, um, about the kind of value of these different chatbots for the consumers. And I wondered whether, um, if you know, is, in your opinion, the value uh, that consumers get from these chatbots, is it about getting the right answer? Is it a value in the interaction itself uh, with the brand or, or uh, some kind of feeling like that? Or is this the value from the feeling of getting a human-like interaction? Or is it perhaps all of those things in, in maybe different situations? Yeah, it is uh, all about, the issue is that uh, uh, if you approach a chatbot uh, because you need uh, uh, some customer assistance, you expect uh, to have your uh, uh, request satisfied. However, it includes not only the effective uh, uh, request, but also the quality of the interaction, because in that moment, the chatbot is not only a machine, is also the interface with the company. So if my request is not satisfied or I have to repeat my question several times using different words, shortening uh, the question because the chatbot uh, doesn't understand, it automatically reduces my uh, image of the brand. It affects my relationship, my general relationship with the brand. And it is uh, more evident uh, in the um, interaction with the machine rather than the interaction with the uh, employee because uh, the employee uh, usually doesn't ask you to uh, use different words or to uh, keep the sentences uh, shorter. And uh, the employee is able to recognize your mood, your emotion, your emotional state. So the value is uh, uh, the value of this experience. So this experience is uh, the interaction uh, and also the uh, satisfaction of the request. So is uh, overall. Mm, so all of those things together maybe give you some kind of consumer experience value. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Anyone? Kate, Davi? Hello. Um, thank you so much, Eleanor. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I think it's so interesting to see this work start to come to fruition around conversational commerce and reducing kind of friction points within these interactions, because I think as your presentation showed, bots have been around for a while and kind of in their infancy, but actually now starting to conceptualize them and think about them as a useful touch point for retailers, I think is really interesting. Um, I really liked your point there about them being the interface with the company. Um, and I wondered if you'd seen any differences or had any insights regarding 
kind of different um, areas of the sector. So differences between luxury, more high ends and more kind of high street, because if that is the kind of opportune moment for personalization to bring that experience to life, um, what your thoughts were around that kind of moment, depending on the sector? Yeah, I think that uh, it can be more useful for uh, luxury sector or high involvement uh, products. Uh, since uh, consumers have a higher expectation from a luxury brand rather than uh, maybe uh, fast fashion. And I'm thinking, for instance, about uh, um, Primark uh, uh, compared to uh, Victoria Beckham. Uh, Primark uh, um, resisted somehow to this uh, digitalization uh, uh, force, while uh, um, luxury uh, brands moved fast towards providing better uh, experiences online. And especially the COVID uh, accelerated this, uh, this process. I noticed that since the beginning of the outbreak last March until now, they introduced more uh, elements. They introduced the chatbot. For instance, uh, UPS had not a chatbot uh, or this kind of uh, assistance uh, in March, while now it has. And also I noticed how uh, it changed because uh, uh, when they introduced it, consumers had to approach the chatbot while now the chatbot approaches you. So they are changing and uh, of course uh, it is um, strictly related to the advancements uh, in the in the sector. However, in this moment, uh, retailers should uh, take into consideration uh, the, the benefits that this uh, uh, system can provide. I'm not saying that uh, this uh, would uh, totally change the sales, uh, will dramatically impact on the sales, but what I'm saying is that uh, they, it uh, could uh, improve the quality of the experience and uh, if used properly as in the case that I mentioned uh, before as a, uh, a recommend um, as a recommendation of the size it could help to reduce uh, the return thank you Eleanor thank you do we have um one last final question Okay, thank you, Eleonora. We we're giving you an applaud here. Woohoo! Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so um, uh, it's three o'clock, uh, quarter past. Arno will uh, start his presentation. Most of us have been uh, on this Zoom meeting now for two hours. Let's uh, just pause for a couple of minutes. Okay, don't leave us. Just pause. Take take a walk, fill take a cup of coffee or something, uh, and uh, see see you in five or ten minutes. Okay. So, oh no, the the um, it's um, yeah your stage. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for the introduction. Um, so thank you very much also for having me here. Uh, so it's my pleasure to uh, to present my research to you. Uh, so I think we already we have already seen two very interesting presentations today. So I'm happy uh, to join this one. So I'm presenting a joint work together with uh, Kunde Bock from Odensia Business School, uh, Christoph Kusma, uh, Christina Ciobano, and myself uh, from ESX School of Management. Uh, and I will talk about store efficiency analytics in a multi-channel retail chain uh, using data and development analysis. So initially this, uh, this methodology was a bit um, yeah, out of our current scope of, um, of research, but I think it fits uh, nicely in what we do uh, at the ESEC Center of Marketing Analytics as well, because we are using data 
to improve um, yeah, real life, uh, real world business uh, decisions. So I think this is uh, a very interesting research topic and I hope you will enjoy it. So let's get started. Can I move my slide? Yeah. Um, so what is on the agenda today? I have a very traditional agenda. Uh, so let's start with the introduction of the topic. So um, to introduce this topic, I would uh, here make the point that the retail landscape has changed uh, tremendously over the past few years, mainly because of uh, digitalization trends. So as you're all familiar with, I guess, um, we see that at least 73% of customers nowadays use multiple channels throughout their sh uh, shopping journey. Uh, we have also seen that many retailers are adopting actually the internet as a secondary sales channels, uh, which led that there is a double digit growth of B2C e-commerce over the past five years. Um, this is actually being reinforced by the COVID-19 crisis. So for example, uh, in Belgium, I, I'm living in Belgium too, I know the numbers there a little bit. Uh, so the first numbers demonstrate that there are actually a big increase in the use of e-commerce both by uh, companies. So there are many companies, businesses that uh, did not have the internet as a secondary sales channels that were actually pushed uh, to use the internet as a secondary sales channel as well because of COVID-19. Uh, but also customers, customers stand, uh, or or spent a lot more on e-commerce because of uh, COVID-19. So this is also expected as this trend is uh, accelerated by COVID-19 uh, and which makes this research also uh, very interesting in today's uh, crisis. So what are we going to look at today? Um, we are actually looking from the perspective of an uh, retail chain. So we are uh, helping a retail chain, which has uh, different shops across uh, France. So you see on the slide, you see a map of uh, France with uh, the Eiffel Tower to indicate where Paris is uh, located. Um, but I guess, uh, Ali, because it's a European audience, you're well familiar with uh, how France looks on the map, uh, so no need to explain this. So here we have uh, yeah, several shops and actually on the retail chain level, they want to assess yeah, the relative efficiency of every store in this multi-channel context. So you can imagine if you are managing a retail chain, uh, you want to compare different stores with each other. So uh, you want to know whether one store is being more efficient than other stores, whether one store is more productive than the other store, uh, which also can lead to strategic decision making, uh, also about bonus policies for different stores. So it's actually a very uh, yeah, hot topic, I would say, in uh, today's uh, retail landscape. So this uh, research is not only important for academics, but also for businesses. And we are going to help retail business using relevant analytics to better assess uh, the relative store efficiency. So we are going to take a data-driven approach to assess uh, the relative store efficiency. So there are two aspects in this question. So first one is, yeah, how are we going to assess the relative efficiency of uh, different stores? So for this, we started by looking at uh, what has already been uh, published about this topic. Um, so what do you see on this slide is uh, basically a slide that groups all uh, research that uh, shows um, yes, some kind of efficiency analysis in a retail setting. So we both include a chain level and store level um, research. And uh, what we noted or what, uh, what is uh, common in these studies is that yeah, most of them actually used uh, DEA or data development analysis as their methodology to assess relative efficiency. So I'm not sure whether you're all familiar with DEA or data envelopment, data envelopment analysis. So I included uh, yeah, basically a textbook slide about uh, this, uh, this methodology. Um, so in DEA, what are we doing? So we are trying to find uh, the best possible production frontier 
of decision-making units. So important is that we are always looking at decision-making units. So uh, this uh, includes some yeah, uh, managerial aspect. So the decision-making unit has to have some inputs over which they can make decisions. So we are looking at uh, inputs. So this is something important for these inputs is that the management has control or can influence these inputs. So on the slide, for example, uh, this is the number of employees. So in uh, a decision-making unit, in our case, the different stores can um, uh, choose about the number of employees that they use in their uh, stores. So this is an input that they can, uh, can change. And the goal of these inputs is to yeah, have some sales. So the sales are our outputs. So this is what actually makes a store efficient. So a high level of sales uh, is, is uh, what we consider in this uh, yeah, small example as more efficient. So we are trying to find uh, yeah, the level of input to find the optimal number of, uh, to, to reach the optimal number of, uh, of sales. Um, so in uh, DEA, we are actually trying to find an uh, efficient frontier. So we are looking at the maximum. So the maximum sales that can be reached given a set of uh, inputs. This is, uh, for example, different from uh, regression where you're looking at uh, the average. So the in a uh, regression, you're you're actually looking at the average. So this uh, this methodology, it's actually looking at the yeah, frontiers. So trying to maximize something. So it's a, a, a quite a different approach here. Um, so once we have our efficient frontier, so it's always relative. So there will be some stores that are considered uh, efficient. So once we have developed our efficient frontier, we can also use this frontier to assess the relative store efficiency of the other uh, stores uh, by looking at the distance from this uh, efficient frontier. So every store uh, has uh, yeah, some distance from the frontier. So this we can use uh, to assess the relative efficiency of different stores. So it's always compared to the other stores, so the, to the other decision-making units in our case. So this was a uh, yeah, small introduction about uh, DEA. It's a bit more complex, but uh, if you understand the basics, you will be able uh, to follow the presentation. Um, so this is about the methodology. So based on our literature review, we actually uh, uh, yeah, found that the DEA is the right approach to assess this relative efficiency. Um, there is also another aspect in our question, so the multi-channel context, so we want to look at it in a multi-channel retail environment. Uh, why do we consider this? Because we know that the presence of a web shop actually influences the stores in two main ways. So firstly, there are some cannibalization and synergy effects. So for example, um, uh, imagine that you have a store and um, the, the store, uh, the, the retail chain suddenly opens a web store. So it is possible that customers that uh, before only purchased at the store are now purchasing as well uh, online as well, so that the store actually loses some, um, some sales to the online channel. So this is a cannibalization effect. Um, it's also possible that there are some synergy effects so, for example, if uh, customers or, or people that were not customer before are suddenly uh, buying using the online channel, they come to pick up the goods at the store and they buy some other stuff at the store, uh, which increases the sale or uh, the sales of a, a specific store. So this can also help to create some synergies effect between the online channel and the offline channel. Um, secondly, we have also seen that actually the e-commerce adoption uh, varies across uh, different cons consumer uh, demographic characteristics, and these characteristics also tend to vary across the uh, customer base, the different stores, the, the customer base of the different stores. So you can imagine that some stores are located more in a uh, city, uh, while other stores are more located on the countryside, which has uh, yeah, totally different customer bases. 
Uh, also, some stores are located in an area with relatively young people, others in areas where there are rel relatively old, older people. So we see that, uh, I mean, we expect that there might some um, variation in the e-commerce adoption as well over the different stores because of, uh, of the, 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 the customer um, base that uh, the store has. So we did an um, exploratory analysis using one e-commerce metric. So in this case, you see the conversion rate. The conversion rate is uh, the percentage of yeah, web store uh, visitors who purchase something over the total number of uh, web visitors, web page visitors. Um, and what do you see on the slide? So you see um, different circles and every circle actually represent uh, a store. So you see in, uh, in the Paris area, for example, you see that there are uh, a lot of stores with relatively high conversion rates. Also in the Bordeaux region, there are stores with relatively high um, conversion rates similar for Lyon and Marseille. So you see actually that uh, near the bigger cities, the conversion rate tends to be a bit, uh, bit higher, while uh, yeah, in the more, um, the more, uh, the areas more on the countryside, there actually the conversion rates tend to be a little, relatively speaking, uh, lower. Also in the border area with uh, Belgium and, um, and Germany, there are also some, uh, the, the conversion rates tend to be a little bit uh, lower. So this actually um, yeah, confirms what we expected, that there are some variations in these e-commerce metrics between the different stores. Um, so this was uh, yeah, one aspect. Um, so we also went back to our literature review and uh, we were looking at, yeah, um, how, first of all, whether uh, the, 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 the studies, the research papers that looked at efficiency already uh, included context, yes or no. So we see that uh, recent literature in, um, in this, on this topic actually tend to include uh, the context. So uh, what is important about the context, it's uh, unlike the input variables that I discussed before, context variables cannot be influenced by the management. So for example, the number of uh, households that live in a certain region. So this is something that cannot be uh, tackled by the management, although they can have an impact on the uh, efficiency of a of a store. So we should somehow correct for this. So this is what we see in most uh, recent uh, literature in most recent papers that actually uh, all these studies yeah, make some kind of a correction for the context. What was actually lacking in our uh, overview is that they never considered uh, e-commerce uh, contextual factors. So uh, none of these uh, studies actually incorporated uh, e-commerce related um, uh, factors, although they might have an impact on, or, or, or although they are different over the different stores. So this is something that we will tackle in this study. So I think the first contribution of this study is that we also include these e-commerce metrics to assess the relative uh, uh, efficiency of, uh, of stores, and we will see that they indeed have an impact on the efficiency scores. Uh, and secondly, we also yeah, use the most up-to-date uh, methodology in, uh, in efficiency analysis, which is a robust uh, two-stage approach where we first do a DEA, DEA analysis and afterwards do a truncated regression and a double bootstrap. Um, to make a correction on the efficiency scores. So this is a uh, yeah, state of the art in uh, efficiency analysis. So um, very conceptually, how does this approach look like? So on the left hand side, we have our conventional inputs and outputs. So these are uh, yeah, the, the inputs, the things that the store managers can uh, can uh, can influence the outputs is what determines uh, what is uh, an efficient store. 
we use this uh, in our two-stage uh, DA procedure. So it's based on the Simon and Wilson paper, which is a yeah, very famous paper in, uh, in efficiency analysis. So the first stage is actually doing this uh, DA, DA analysis. This gives you a bunch of efficiency scores. So you will already see uh, the relative uh, um, efficiency of all these uh, different stores. The second part is doing a truncated regression to actually make a correction uh, for contextual variables. So contextual variables, again, these are variables that uh, the store management cannot influence. So in our uh, research, uh, we actually use two model variations. So first variant uh, looking at only store environment. So in line with what uh, yeah, most research is doing right now. And a second uh, variation looks both at store environment and e-commerce metrics, uh, which we grouped in three uh, types of e-commerce metrics. Uh, first one was the web store performance, second one social media related uh, metrics, and a third one is the multi-channel tactics performance. But I will uh, give some more detail or we'll shed some, I will shed some more light on it in a second. Um, so using these contextual variables, we actually will correct our efficiency scores and these can be used to do a profile analysis of our different stores, which uh, can help uh, management to make strategic decisions. Um, so how does our experiment look like? So we are using real world data from a French uh, do it yourself retailer with uh, 105 stores in uh, in france uh, so we have three different types of uh, variables or so inputs output and contextual variables so first look at our input variables so these are yeah, the, the most important um yeah uh, management decisions that uh, a store can make that the store manager can make uh, so these are also we yeah, had based on um, on uh, some discussions with the company. So they helped us with determine which are the most uh, relevant inputs. So they are looking at full time equivalents. Uh, they are looking at the average transaction size of a store, also uh, at the inventory uh, and the total discounts that are provided. Uh, secondly, we have our output. So this will determine whether a store is efficient yes or no so we will base this decision on uh, the total turnover and the operating profit so these are the two um, metrics or kpis that are used to determine the efficiency um, and thirdly we have our contextual variables so first we have our conventional metrics which are mainly about the store environment so we have for example the distance to a store uh, the distance to a competitor, the number of competitors in the region, uh, the age of the stores, the occupational cost uh, by square meter. So this is also um, a uh, contextual variable because it cannot be managed by uh, the store management. So this is uh, something that was, uh, was fixed. Uh, same for the population in the re region, the number of households and the average income of, uh, of the households. Um, next, we also included our e-commerce metrics. So in our case, these are also contextual variables because the e-commerce and the websites are all managed at the chain level. So a store uh, manager cannot uh, impact these decisions. So we have three types. So first, we have our website performance, uh, including the conversion rate, which I discussed already before. You also have uh, the average time that the customer spends on the site, the bounce rate. So the bounce rate is if a certain customer enters um, the website and immediately leaves. So we are looking at uh, the percentage of customers or sessions that just enter the website and immediately leave, uh, which is, uh, is a common metric, it's uh, the bounce rate. We're also looking at the average visits by a visitor uh, and the average web basket size. Um, secondly, we also have social media engagement variables. So the social media resp uh, responsiveness. So it's basically how fast uh, the retail chain answers to um, to the to the comments of 
of, uh, of users on the Facebook page. Uh, we also have uh, fan engagement and number of uh, fans. So base, these are based uh, on, uh, on the Facebook uh, web pages of, uh, of the stores, which are managed by the, by the chain. Um, and we also have multi-channel tactics. So for example, the percentage of clients online and offline. Uh, we're also looking at uh, the store pickups. So if something is ordered online and picked up at the store. So we're also looking at this percentage. And we are also looking at uh, incremental revenue by pickups. So if something was ordered online, picked up at the store, the, the incremental uh, revenue by other things that were bought in this, uh, in this session. So this is also one of the metrics. Um, so I already discussed before that uh, we expected that these uh, e-commerce metrics actually will differ over the different stores. And if we dive deeper in the different metrics that I presented before, we indeed uh, see for all these metrics some uh, variability indicating that um, yeah, there are some differences over the different stores which is important because if there are differences over the different stores, of course, it can also happen that these impact the efficiency of uh, a store because of uh, these uh, e-commerce contextual metrics. So um, what, are our, what are the results? So what did we found? So what are we looking at on this slide? So in this slide, we're actually looking uh, at um, at uh, yeah, the, the, the parameter estimates of our contextual variables on the efficiency scores. So we are in the second stage of our uh, DEA analysis. So we are now looking at how our uh, contextual variables impact uh, the efficiency. Um, what is the first thing that we noted is um, that uh, firstly, we see that our e-commerce model has a much better fit than the conventional model. So this is already an indication that, um, yeah, including this, uh, these e-commerce metrics actually helps in, um, in explaining uh, the differences in the efficiency scores. So it's actually from a managerial uh, perspective, it, uh, you should include these, uh, these e-commerce metrics because the model uh, gives a better fit. Um, if we look at the different uh, parameter uh, estimates, um, we can compare uh, the two models. Um, so the first thing that, uh, that I uh, should tell is that yeah, the conventionally, uh, conventional uh, efficiency scores uh, are awarded uh, in, an, uh, the, in a DA model range actually from zero to one. Uh, but here we are looking at the truncated regression component of our two-stage DA. Uh, and this models the reciprocal of our DA score, which means that the positive coefficient actually reflects a negative impact on store efficiency. So I wanted to mention this. So uh, that there is uh, to avoid confusion when interpreting uh, the, the, the different um, parameter estimates. Um, so what do we see if we look, for example, at the store environment? So there we see uh, that our both models actually emphasize the same uh, significant variables with similar magnitudes. So uh, this is already a good sign. Uh, and also the signs are always in the same direction. So it's quite uh, stable, our, our model. Uh, and uh, the, the factors that were um, that that impacted the efficiency scores in the conventional model are also are also coming back in the e-commerce model. So we have, for example, uh, the distance to a competitor. So um, in uh, in our model, if there is an increase in the distance to the nearest competitor, it's also associated uh, with an increase in the efficiency of a, of a store. Uh, same effect for the occupational cost and um, the opposite effect for the household income. Um, if we are looking at our e-commerce model, um, we actually see that um, all uh, the 
the, the categories that we define, so the web store performance, the social media related variables and the multi-channel synergies all have at least one variable that is uh, significant, that has a significant impact on the efficiency scores. So more specifically, uh, the average web visits have an impact on, um, on the, the web store performance, also the number of fans uh, and uh, pickups. So the, the, the orders uh, of online and the, um, and the pickup offline uh, also has an impact on the efficiency of a, of a certain uh, web store. So these are all in line uh, with, uh, with, uh, with previous uh, research um, or, or in line with what could be expected from, uh, from research. Um, so for example, for the last one, if you're looking at the pickups um, that happened, uh, uh, if you order something online and you pick it up uh, offline, uh, if the, the percentage increases, uh, also the store um, will be uh, operating more efficiency. So why can this be explained? It can be explained that the customers that come to pick up their orders already know what they uh, want to buy, um, which um, which. Uh, Makes some uh, which which uh, which makes that they don't have a lot of questions for the employees, so the employees can actually use their time more productive doing other stuff. Um, so this is a, a possible explanation why, for example, the the, the pickups has a uh, significant impact on the efficiency of a store. So this was maybe a quite technical, so we will now jump into the, the managerial implications. So first thing uh, that we compare here is uh, actually the, the density plots. So on the left panel, you see the probability density of um, the two models that we have. So the red line is our conventional model, so only using store environment variables. The blue one is the one where we also included the e-commerce uh, metrics and the dotted line is the original uh, efficiency scores without uh, any correction. So what we see from the left side panel is actually that uh, by making the correction of the efficiency scores, uh, most of the stores will be considered less efficient as uh, um, if you would not do this uh, correction. Um, second observation that we could make from the left panel is that the distribution of our conventional model and our integrated model is actually quite similar. Um, so this actually uh, might suggest that there's some similar similarity between both models in terms of efficiency scores. But if we look at the right hand panel, we uh, look at um, um, at the, the average uh, absolute deviations from, um, from the, the original efficiency score for both the integrated model and the conventional model. And we see there uh, that there are actually as quite uh, big deviations between the two models. So we'll zoom into this, uh, these deviations between the two models in, uh, in uh, in, in the next slide as well, because this is really important from a managerial perspective. Um, so how are these efficiency scores used in uh, the focal uh, retail chain? So every store actually gets a score ranging from one to 10 um, based on, uh, on this uh, efficiency analysis with one, the least efficient uh, stores and 10, the most efficient stores. Uh, what you see on the slide is actually um, the, the, the scores that uh, certain uh, stores would have had based on the two models. So the one with only including the store environment um, information and the other one with both the store environment and the e-commerce metrics. So if uh, stores are on the diagonal, it means that they are uh, located in the same efficiency uh, segment so that they received the same score. The ones that are deviating from the diagonal actually have a different score uh, based on the, the two models. So it's actually uh, because we have seen 
that the model that includes the e-commerce metrics is actually uh, has a better fit. So it's a, 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 it explains better uh, the, the the reality. Um, so if you would not include the e-commerce metrics, you would actually classify 33 stores out of 102 stores in an um, suboptimal efficiency segment, which uh, is more than 30% of uh, the stores. And this has a big um, implication on the strategic, strategic, strategic decisions of uh, the chain management. So the chain actually uses this information to allocate uh, resources to different stores. It uses the information to uh, assign bonuses to different store managements, to different employees. So it actually has a big impact on a lot of employees and a lot of uh, stores uh, operations. So it's uh, really crucial to do this efficiency analysis as correct as uh, possible, uh, which is the case if you include the e-commerce information. So to conclude, um, I will come back to some key points of this research. So what did we see in our, our research? So we used a uh, robust two-stage DA approach to assess the relative efficiency, and we applied it on a real-world case uh, um, in, um, in a do-it-yourself uh, retail uh, setting. Um, we incorporated uh, e-commerce metrics and we demonstrated that actually by incorporating these e-commerce metrics as contextual variables, we actually are better in explaining the efficiency scores and we are better in representing the, the reality that, uh, that we observe. So we strongly um, advise companies to include these metrics in their efficiency analysis. And thirdly, um, we have seen that a suboptimal assessment of relative efficiency can have a big impact on the strategic decisions of a company, both on the allocation of uh, resources to stores, but also on the bonuses of uh, many employees of the, the chain. So this was uh, my presentation. So thank you for your attention and feel free to ask yeah, questions or provide some suggestions. Uh, I also included my contact details. So in case uh, you, you have some questions or you want to know more about this uh, research topic, uh, feel free to contact me after the uh, event as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so, do, do we have uh, questions? Uh, Carries, go. Sorry for dominating the questions, and thank you, uh, Arno, for um, a really interesting um, presentation. Uh, I just wanted to ask a point of clarification because I'm very, very poor with uh, quantitative research and understanding exactly what uh, factors and uh, things like that mean. So, I wanted to just check: does does what you um, does your analysis? suggest that physical stores are actually generating online sales but that those sales are kind of not um, accounted for in the traditional efficiency models is that a, a kind of correct interpretation um so we, we we did not look specifically at the um effect of uh, the offline sales on the online sales so this is also an uh, interesting angle but it's more from an uh, um, we are looking if, if we, we are doing this efficiency analysis for the, the retail store at hand, it was actually uh, the case that uh, the, the web store, the website is actually managed on chain level and uh, the, the store management cannot impact uh, the, the website sales. So it's entirely managed on the, the, the chain level and not on the store level. Um, of course, this uh, additional channel can have an impact on the sales of uh, offline stores. And this is actually uh, what we are trying to, to model the effect of the online sales on the offline sales to make a better uh, assessment of the efficiency of the offline sales, of the offline stores. So it's more like the res reverse of what I suggested, actually. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Okay. But it's, uh, I think it's also an interesting re uh, research question. 
Um, but in, yeah, in our case, it was uh, the other way around. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have other questions? Then uh, I have a, sorry, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, is this uh, published already? Can I get a copy of the paper? If so, um, it's uh, not yet published. So we are actually currently uh, reviewing uh, the paper. Um, but I will, yeah, I can provide you with uh, a working paper of uh, of uh, of this research if you like. Sure. But it's, sure. It, it's not yet. Uh, it's not yet published. It's uh, yeah under review. Thank at you. This thank stage. you. Any other um, comments or or uh, question? L let me go then. Uh, I have a question on. So uh, my first question is. Uh, so uh, the model says that, uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong, click and collect improve uh, the efficiency of the store. Um, so, you, so you're referring to... This one, pickups. This one. Yeah, so the pickups is... Uh, uh, indeed, it improves uh, the uh, efficiency of a of a store. So, if you have, relatively speaking, more uh, yeah pickups, so collect and uh, and go, uh, it improves the efficiency of uh, the store. So, if if you compare two stores, one with uh, a lot of uh, pickups and another store with uh, yeah less pickups, the store with more pickups, which is which are orders that were uh, ordered online and picked up offline, is more efficient. And yeah. this can be explained uh, because yeah, we're looking at the do-it-yourself retailer. So typically, these are uh, consumers that uh, want some explanation when they are buying something. So, for example, they they are selling uh, yeah some paint, so they might have some questions about different colors, uh, and the employees are also there to support. Uh, customers uh, once they have questions or once uh, one one uh, have to do a certain um, task in in the home to to renovate uh, the house. So also the employees have a function to advise uh, the customers. Uh, so if we see that customer already um, uh, ordered online, so he already made a decision, so he does not need all the information from uh, the employees. So it's actually speed ups uh, the, the process. And uh, we see that yeah, the employees in the store can actually use their time more to advise other clients, uh, provide some more detail there. Mm -hmm. um, so we see if, if a large part of the sales is from the pickups, these store are relatively speaking more efficient. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a retailer. He is, um, so uh, the would that this piece of research then tell the the managers that uh, oh look these uh, out, these outlets that have uh, pickups or, or facilitate this in different ways they, it could be could be uh, for example if we have uh, IKEA for example they are now uh, having uh, parcel lockers they have uh, uh, you have a click and collect you, they have different ways of just going there and pick up. Uh, uh, would this yeah. be ind indicating that that these kind of um, th these uh, these ways of collecting or picking up is improving the efficiency? Yeah, it can be an indication that it uh, will improve the uh, efficiency of a store uh, because yeah, the the, the, the customer uh, Ali, you spent on average less time on the customer uh, than you would in an uh, in an uh, entirely offline setting. Uh, which yes yeah, saves time and which uh, in the end saves money, um, but uh, the goal of this research is also yet yeah, to to um, actually correct for these kind of effects. So the store management itself cannot impact uh, these decisions. So it's also driven by yeah, the the customer uh, itself. Uh, but on an on an uh, on the retail chain level, they can actually try to. 
uh, yes, spread it more towards uh, stores that where, where this is not yet well uh, integrated or where the customers mm. are not yet very familiar with this uh, this uh, this uh, all of these pickups. Yeah. Um, but it's only for the store management management. It's actually different, uh, difficult to manage this because it's uh, on the manage on on, an, uh, on a higher level. It's managed on the the retail chain. So that's why well, the, the idea is here that um, if two stores have the same uh, efficiency, but one store has a lot of pickups and the other one uh, does not have any pickups, for example, it's maybe uh, the other store that is using the employees more efficiently uh, than the store with more pickups. So that's uh, what, what, what we were interested in in this, uh, this research. Yeah. Great, great piece. Do, do we have other questions? But then, okay, thank you, Arno. Uh, so it's time to wrap up this uh, afternoon. Um, thank you all for participating, especially you, uh, Eleonora, and you, Arno. Uh, Jens is not with us here not right now, but thank you a lot. Really appreciate it. Um, uh, we have a seminar. I think the next seminar is tomorrow afternoon. And Karis, you will be the moderator there. It's on future consumption. So be there. Three excellent, outstanding, amazing researchers will present again. Um, uh, and on Thursday, what do we have on Thursday? Yes, Julia is trying to uh, nudge. Mm -hmm. So on Thursday online, you can uh, participate in Julia's uh, public defense of her PhD. You're all very welcome. Um, it was broadcasted online. Please, she really likes really difficult questions because it's a public defense. Just really suck it in and try to give her really nasty questions. So this Preferably is out of my field. Uh, it's so I hope you can see it's about self-service last month delivery, e-consumer perspective on service renovation. Uh, there will be uh, David Grant will be opponent. Uh, we will have good, uh, excellent researchers in the committee. Uh, so if you don't have difficult questions, they will they will have difficult questions. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's um, th that's a wrap up. So uh, I hope you hope that you enjoyed today, and that we can yeah see us tomorrow and on first day. And uh, once again, thank you, Eleonora. Thank you, Ono, for um, uh, for this uh, webinar. My pleasure. So thank you for having me and uh, have a nice evening all. Okay. Thank you all. Enjoy the evening.